Deverin. We're back on stage together. We've become stage buddies over the, the past years. Somehow it's a duo infernale, you and me, sitting at tech conferences and speaking about uh, Duolingo, Europe, and what's next. Um, you said there was a special way you wanted to start today's talk, so uh, over to you. Yes, actually, I have a question. So, um, question for the audience. If you are a Duolingo user, show me with your hands how long is your streak. So, one means 10 days or longer, two means 20 days or longer, 10 means 100 days or longer. Wow. That's a, that's a lot of long streaks. Anyone above 1,000? Yeah, there. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Nice, nice, nice. I have a surprise for you in that context, Severin. Um, so the last time we were on stage together, we were at another European tech conference. And I asked Severin, how did you build a brand that everyone in the world knows? And he said, it's the owl. And I was, I was maybe I was nervous. I froze. And I, I really just didn't remember that the owl is the, is the icon, is the mascot of Duolingo. And so I, I blacked out and I said, which owl? And uh, Severin was a bit stunned on stage. He, I think he was a bit cross with me at the time. And so what I did this time is I went to the gift shop of Duolingo on their website and I posted the largest order ever for stuffed animal Duolingo owls. And I knew that he would start the talk by asking for the streak. And so not right now in the audience, um, those with a thousand day streak, raise your hand because you're going to get a Duolingo owl um, because we, we had a box coming into Helsinki. And, um, <laughs> and uh, here's one for you. Um, <laughs> you. You get to give it to, to, to anyone or maybe actually I have someone that should get it, and you might want to give it back when you hear that story. Because this morning, um, at the hotel reception where I'm staying here in Helsinki, I asked for that package. And uh, the receptionist, she handed over the package, and she said, I have to ask, there's little Duolingo owls on that, on that package. Um, what, what is this? And I told her the story, and I told her that I was going to be here. Of course, she knew about Slush. She's from Finland. She works here in a hotel. And she said, how cool, you're on stage with the, with the founder of Duolingo. You know what, I have a streak of 1,483 days. And that was, for me, once again a reminder of how remarkable it is what you've built, Severin. And um, I uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Alex, and the reason I'm here is because I run a venture capital firm that invests only in Switzerland. And um, Severin happens to be from Switzerland. And uh, when we started out, we asked all Swiss entrepreneurs to support us in boosting this small ecosystem. Severin was so kind to do that from the first day on. And um, what you've built in the meantime is incredible, Severin. You are the CTO, co-founder, member of the board of a stock-listed company that is the largest language learning application in the world, most used most loved. And what I find amazing about it is that with a lot of tech things, we tend to have love-hate relationships. Social media, we're worried about our mental health, you know, Google, too many ads. There's like always some negative to it, but everyone loves Duolingo. Do you pinch yourself sometimes that this is your reality? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it is uh, truly remarkable. Uh, I mean, I obviously did not expect it to be ever this successful. Um, and it, and it's, 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 what's remarkable is like, yeah, truly everyone loves Duolingo. And it's a, it's a good company for the world. Uh, I truly believe that. And that's why I'm still with the company after you know, IPO and all that. And um, you, you, you IPO'd, um, I think you IPO'd at 6 billion US dollars at NASDAQ. And um, there was a bit of skepticism, if I may say that so bluntly. Obviously, everyone was wondering monetization. You know, is this is this going to be a, a real business or is it just an, an app, a productivity app? And I checked the market cap this morning, and we're beyond nine billion US dollars. And your IPO was a year and a half or two years ago. So, um, in the roughest of times, where most tech stock was punished severely you managed to increase your market cap by 50%. That is insane. Like, what's, what's going on? What's happening? Why is the world so, so keen on Duolingo today? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And, and by the way, we don't look at you know, our stock price every day. And it's not a KPI that we try to optimize. What we try to do is you know, achieve our mission, which is to provide the best education and make it universally accessible. And going back to the you know, why you know, we're a public company, but we have a, an operating principle that is take the long view. So we want to build a long-lasting, hopefully 100-year-lasting company. And you know, to, today's stock price uh, you know, is, is ir irrelevant if you, if you take the long view. So, but, but why it probably went up is because the, the, the market rewards uh, execution and um, you know, the, the profitability and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, that is good. But we have, yeah, we've been just executing really well since the beginning, I would say. <laughs> well, congratulations and thank you that you're here with me today. Uh, we're in an audience um, of students, founders, young entrepreneurs at the beginning of their journey. There's also some tech decision makers, investors here. So I thought we'd speak about three things in the next uh, 20 minutes. And I would love to go a bit back into your journey starting the, um, the company, how was that building, building Duolingo? I want to speak a bit about where does Duolingo stand today and what are you working on? What are the you know, product roadmap topics that you're discussing, business model changes, a bit you know, out, of the, out of the boardroom, what's, what's going on at Duolingo? And then the last third of our, our talk, we need to talk about something that in 2023 you cannot ignore, which is AI and how that relates to, to what you're doing at, at Duolingo. So let's get started with the look back. Um, you studied in Switzerland um, at the Technical University in Zurich, and then you moved to the US and you started your business there. Um, why did you choose to go to the US? And I understand you co-founded with your professor. How did that come to happen? Can you tell us the, like the founding story, your path from Switzerland to incorporating Duolingo and also maybe a timestamp? When was that? Yes. So I've um, I've always wanted to study in the U.S. Uh, so I grew up in Switzerland, small town close to, close to Zurich. Uh, I've always wanted to study in the U.S. for a little bit. Um, but I went to ETH in, in Zurich, which is you know, a very good technical school there. And uh, it was good. And they didn't have an exchange program with the university I wanted to go to in the U.S. But the sister university of ETH had that exchange program. Mm. And I managed to get myself into that exchange program. And that exchange program is really what led to everything else down the road. So it was uh, an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, obviously, I didn't know that at the time, but I've always wanted to study there, uh, study in the US. And the uh, exchange program was between EPFL and Carnegie Mellon University. And at Carnegie Mellon University, I met my eventual co-founder, Luis. Uh, he was uh, one of the youngest professors at the time at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, when I met him, uh, I introduced myself as I'm Severin, hacker. <laughs> and he still, <laughs> still remembers that. And, and uh, that's how, how, how I met him. And I, uh, he was the smartest person I had ever met up until then. And I was like, if I can ever work with this guy, I'll try. I, I'll, I will do that. And he convinced me to stay at Carnegie Mellon for grad school. So he was a professor. I was his grad student. And um, two years into my PhD, we started working on what eventually turned into Duolingo. Nice. And so your professor is your co-founder. And my understanding is he's been at that time already a serial entrepreneur that had a very successful exit to Google. So this is someone that has a really high standing within the startup community in the US, probably made it easy to raise first funding and you know, get some attention to, to Duolingo at that time. But how was the dynamic between the two of you as co-founders? Because you know, it's not the typical story of three students that you know, as equal co-founders start something, but there's, there's been a bit of a hierarchy difference between the two of you. And how has that been at the beginning? And how has that evolved until today? Because you're two co-founders, and both of you are still in the board even though the company is now publicly listed, which is not often the case. Yeah, the great question. So, and by the way, most of the time this doesn't work. So usually uh, when there's a professor and a grad student starting a company, it's the professor owns 
and uh, grad student owns 1%, <laughs> and <laughs> grad student does all the work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it never works. It never works. Um, but in our partnership, it was, it was equal from day one. And we had a, a little contract, actually, that I still have at home, where we wrote down you know, what we, how we make decisions at, at Duolingo. You know, how do we do Who is responsible for fundraising? Who is responsible for this and that? And, and we wrote this down. We signed it. it was not, it's not a legal contract in, yeah. you, know, like, uh, you would you know, see from a lawyer. But it, it, it worked. And it, it, it's, it's magical. It's, um, it probably prevented tons of arguments. Mm. And just having a clear division of labor and, and role and ownership that's, that's, I think, the, the secret to, to this nice. relationship. This is interesting. And actually, in fact, I didn't know that. We never spoke about this before. But when we invest as a venture firm, one of the things that is extremely important to us is an equal share split between co-founders. Because you know, the moment it is not equal, any discussion turns very emotional because there's some sort of power dynamic that is not necessarily healthy. So that, that's, that's cool to hear the, the confirmation of that, even in a setup like this. Now, um, Duolingo, IPO today, you raised some funding in between. If you look back at the journey, and you're speaking in front of entrepreneurs here, um, what are like the, the big milestones, the ups and downs, the memorable moments that you think were key to, to, to becoming the success story that you became today? So I only remember the ups. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so obviously, the first one was founding of Duolingo. Yeah. When was that? Uh, 2012. 2012. Okay, nice. So 2012, and we started as a website, uh, and it was you know growing slowly. It was nothing magical, but it was a pretty good product, I would say. Um, but it was a website. So next milestone was mobile, and I remember the day before we launched our first iOS app. Luis and I said like, ah, oh, you know, what what do you expect from this launch? You know, like how many users would we get? And and Luis and I was like, yeah, we agreed on maybe 5% of our user base will be on mobile, 95% <laughs> will be on web. And within, I think, a week or two weeks, it was all mobile. Crazy. And in that year, we grew 14x wow. in one year. So mobile was a huge milestone for us. And fundraising must have been a piece of cake that year? Yes, yeah. because we raised on $0 revenue, which is, by the way, better than a little bit of revenue, okay. at least at the time. Yeah. Things, things have changed. <laughs> but at, at the time, no revenue was better than a little bit of revenue. And, and then we, um, yeah, we raced on the, on the growth, on the user, user growth. Next milestone was subscriptions. So figuring out monetization. When was that, like, roughly? I think that was 2016. 16, yeah. So four years into the business, you started to generate revenue, or you took the decision we would try to generate revenue from that user base. Yes, yes. And, and it, it was a very hard uh, decision internally, because as I said before, we are a mission-based company, and we hire all of these people that are motivated by the mission. Yeah. And you know, when we said, like, we're going to have ads, they were like, wait, we can't show ads. Like, that's that's not the mission, right? We, yeah. we, we shouldn't make money, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so how did you motivate internally? Did you um, like tell people that it's a means to an end, that you need the revenue, that you need the business model behind it in order to be able to keep growing and executing on that, on that mission? Or how did you sell that? Yes, so we, we said the mission is to provide the, the best education, make it universally accessible. That doesn't mean that there are no payers. What it means, it means, it, it, it means that we don't put content behind a paywall. So that anyone who wants or needs to learn a language can do so with Duolingo, whether they have a bank account or a credit card or not. So, and this is still true today. So we, we, we obviously monetize, and we're, you know, uh, monetization is, is doing super well at, du at Duolingo, but you don't have to pay for content. So the way we monetize is by um, a feature-based subscription. Yeah. So, so subscription was the big... That was the big game changer? That was a big... Yeah. Before and did that, that, did that work immediately? Because I guess a lot of entrepreneurs would be really scared. You've been, you've been showing a track record of having users, of getting people excited to use your product, but then, you know, are people ready to pay money for it? Is that a moment where you, you have a few sleepless nights and a bit of nervosity today, or...? It, it worked pretty quickly, actually. Yeah. 
So, and, and we weren't the first subscription. So there were already, you know, uh, yeah, Spotify, et cetera. Th things were, people were already used to subscriptions to a degree. Um, but for us, it was mostly an, an internal challenge. Ah. Once we built it, it was, you know, it took off very quickly. And did you use that traction to then raise funds again? Yes. So it's inflection points. First, you went to mobile, massive growth, you raised funding. Then you launched subscription revenue from nothing to relevant. You raised funding. And then you raised probably a last round pre-IPO. Is that more or less the funding story? Yeah. And uh, what's, what's funny is because for the first five years, we made no revenue. Yeah. People just assumed this is going to be, this is a research project by two academics. And they're going to sell it to Google because my co-founder <laughs> sold the past two companies to Google. Yeah. So I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, I think there was even a TechCrunch story at some point. You know, they're going to sell to Google or, or whatever. But um, the moment we made significant revenue, we realized we don't actually have to sell. And we can stay independent and go the, the IPO route. And, and, and follow that mission that you had defined when you, when you started, Louis and you. And that's interesting because we, we, um, we've gotten to know each other better and better over the past years. And we, we've had some conversations where I was just out of curiosity asked some of the VC questions you would ask someone like yourself. is like, you know, did you have funds that passed on you? And now in retrospect, you're like, haha, look at what, what we've done. And, um, and the list of those funds, there was a lot of big brand names that they just didn't believe that you guys are going to turn this into a business. Um, if you were a founder and you're sitting in the audience right now, and maybe you're, I don't know, raising your seed round or your Series A, would you tell founders, don't worry too much about which VC is backing you, get the money, stick to your mission, and keep executing? Or is it really important to convince those top-tier funds that what you're doing deserves their, their attention and money? Ladder. So, uh, we are at the longer we're strong believers that you should hire the best people, only work with the best people, not just not just for employees, but you know, investor. Work with the best investors, work with the best law firms, only work with the best. Always. Interesting. And so that that was then was that discouraging? But obviously, stay true to, to the mission. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and sometimes it's tough, right? But because when, when investors sit in front of you and say you're not generating revenue, like um, we're, we're not going to invest in you, and your mission is to not focus on revenue, but focus on the impact you can create with people trying to learn language. Okay, um, Duolingo Today. Last time we were on stage together was roughly six months ago, and your PR department told me I'm not allowed to ask anything outside of language. And uh, I was a good boy, and I stuck to it. But I understand now we're allowed to talk about it, and there's math and music. Um, uh, available to learn via Duolingo. Um, how, how did that happen? Yes, so as I said before, our mission is not just about language learning, it's all of education. And, you know, for the first 10 years, we focused on language learning. But we always wanted to expand to other subjects. And finally, you know, this last year, we got to a stage where we felt comfortable adding new subjects. And the way we did it is the Duolingo way. So we added those subjects to the main learning app. So you don't need to download another app or install it, whatever. It's the main learning app. And you just, instead of learning Spanish, you go into the course switcher and say, I want to learn math, or I want to learn music. And all the, all the game mechanics we've built for Duolingo, they're there too. So your streak transfers. Your gems and XP, all of that transfers, um, the leaderboards, etc. So you have all of these engagement features that have been so powerful for Duolingo available for these new subjects as well. And is there a bit of hybris to that, if I may ask critically, um, in the sense that you know, language learning is one thing. It's a lot about, I think, memorizing, hearing how someone says it. Now, you could argue math, there's also an aspect of memorizing, but there's also a deeper understanding of the rule set, um, maybe similar to grammar, but still it feels different. Music feels different. Um, it, it almost feels a little arrogant to say, you know what, now we're Duolingo, we're going to teach everything now. It's, it's easy as pie. Um, have you tested this for a long time? Have you? 
Like, how have you built that product? How, how do you avoid that you defocus, that you derail attention of your team? Now, I understand it's within the same app, but internally, suddenly you're not a language company anymore. Suddenly you're a learning company, and that is, that is a change of, of focus. So how, how, like, how do you look at those questions? Yeah, it's, so, so we, we start with, by the way, right now it's just math and music. Uh, and we start with those two because we believe the Duolingo method of how we teach languages can be applied to those two other subjects. So the, the Duolingo method is very much based on implicit learning. So learning from examples, learning by doing. Yeah. And this works well for, for math, for example. Um, this is not all of math, but it works for like the, the arithmetic, fractions, multiplication, et cetera, et cetera. So the basic math, we believe, can be learned efficiently with an adapted version of the Duolingo method. But this Same way you music. drift off a little bit into children as focus users. Is that a correct assumption? Because obviously during school time, I mean, I don't know if anyone here, raise your hand if you're really into learning math. It's probably a lot less than those that want to learn Spanish. And uh, so is, is that also a conscious choice to go into uh, you know, guiding students during school years through le learning process and helping them? Yeah, it's a good question. And math has a, has a bad brand, <laughs> has a brand problem. So a lot of people have you know, bad memories from math in school, et cetera. And they, they, that's the one thing they definitely don't want to do uh, or, or learn. Um, but, but we believe it's one of those fundamental skills that anyone on the planet at some point needs to learn. So yes, we're, 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 we're still trying to figure out you know, what is the, the math product for adults and what is the math product for, uh, for children. Um, so there, there could be a, a math product for VCs, uh, because every year we have some crazy hype where a lot of VCs uh, forget about math, it's my understanding. And in the past years, we had last mile delivery and metaverse, and I'm really glad, and NFT trading, I'm glad we're out of this bubble. But this year, it's AI. Um, and uh, everyone is talking about it, everyone wants to invest in it, everyone is also worried about it. And um, the, 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 first, <laughs> the first headline we had for, the, for this talk here was um, Duolingo disrupted by AI, question mark. And then Severin's um, PR department said, we cannot do this, it has to be more positive. And um, we, we said, we're still going to openly speak about this. Is it something that you're worried about? When we see ChatGPT going and translating better than you know, Google Translate does, we see them scripting whole episodes of The Simpsons. Um, with, with generative AI. So are you worried that language learning is going to be changed? Hopefully it will be changed. And uh, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to this, to this world, actually. I, I think it's a great opportunity for, for Duolingo. AI is a huge opportunity for Duolingo. And let me, let me talk to two points about this. One is we, we want to teach with technology, right? So if we want to achieve our mission, we have to rely on technology. The best way, by the way, to learn almost anything is with a one-on-one -on -one tutor. And it's very expensive. This is how you know, the kings in, in the early days, they, they're like, you know, in the 19th century, this is how they taught their kids. They hired the best teacher, and it was one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And that's the best. To this day, this is still the best way to learn almost anything in the world. Problem, it's very expensive. So what we want to do with Duolingo is use technology and AI to replicate that eff efficacy of a one-on-one -on -one tutor inside Duolingo. So basically, not going to disrupt you, not going to replace you. It's just one more tool in the toolkit of the Duolingo engineers and product team to think about how they can create that personal tutor for every single user of Duolingo. And then the other part of AI is, do you still need to learn a language? And is that why you go into math and music? Are you worried that people are going to stop learning languages? When I was young, people said you need to learn French in order to work in France. I think nowadays English to work anywhere in Europe is going to be sufficient. Is, I, do you see a, a trend there? Or is the interest, the hunger of people to learn other languages to you know, fit into other cultures, is that something that you think will not be broken by, by good automated translation? So that was not the motivation. And there's, there's two things. And it was like, to the previous point as well, is one thing that's interesting about Duolingo, our users, especially in the United States, is like, if you ask them, what would you do if Duolingo went away? The app went away, which other app would you use? 
Guess, guess what, what they say. Oof. Um, bubble? <laughs> no. <coughs> no, none, none of them. None of the comp comp competitors. They say, I would spend more time on Instagram, TikTok, okay. social media. Okay. So we're competing. We don't, we don't compete with the other language learning apps. We compete with people's attention, for people's attention. And we, yeah, so we compete with social media. And so yeah. why do they learn a language? Because they have fun learning a language. They have fun learning a language. And that is remarkable. And I see the timer blinking because that means we're out of time. But I think it's a beautiful finish because what you've achieved deserves so much gratitude. You've turned something that is really, really hard. I mean, all of us here in the audience, I don't know about you, but learning vocabulary for our French test, it was painful. And Duolingo turns this into fun. And um, even, even like the receptionist at the hotel this morning told me that she's on a more than a thousand streak, like I said earlier. Everyone loves Duolingo, and it's become a competitor not to other learning apps. It's become a competitor to watching videos, playing games, or being on social media. And that's amazing. Congratulations, Severin. Thank you for being here on stage with me today. And thank you all for listening to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.